Good afternoon, and welcome to Programmers Paradise webinar series with Quest Spotlight on Database and Messaging. Today we're going to hear a, a, a presentation and a demonstration uh, on the Spotlight on SQL Server uh, product. Before we start, I'd like to uh, just give you a brief overview of what we will see today. Um, first, I'm going to go through a few slides introducing Programmers Paradise, and then very quickly we'll hand over the, uh, uh, the ball to Ari Weil, who's a solution architect and SQL Server domain expert with Quest Software. And uh, Ari's got a great, uh, a great demonstration uh, lined up for you, which I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll enjoy. Programmers Paradise is a leading e-seller of developer and infrastructure tools. Primary among those are the Quest software solutions for application management, Windows management, virtualization, and database management. We have a whole series of, uh, of services around those software solutions, including modeling and infrastructure, and around the Spotlight series. One of the things that, uh, if you're interested, you should ask us about is our flexible payment options. We deal with a suite of infrastructure and application lifecycle uh, uh, products. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, the Spotlight series. Um, we also have application lifecycle management, virtualization, security, business continuity products. Okay, that's enough for, uh, for, for uh, programmers. I'd like to now hand you over to uh, Ari Weil, who's going to give us a presentation on Spotlight on SQL Server performance. Ari, over to you. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, like you mentioned, my name is Ari Weil. I'm a, a SQL Server Solutions Architect with Quest Software, and we're going to talk about Spotlight on SQL Server Enterprise, which is one of a number of database performance monitoring and management tools in the Quest suite of products for SQL Server. Spotlight, as you may or may not know, is a product that is part of a suite that covers Active Directory, Exchange, Oracle, Sybase, DB2, and there's some other flavors of Spotlight out there in the enterprise as well. Spotlight on SQL Server Enterprise actually blends together two different Spotlight products. It's gonna to bring together uh, Spotlight on SQL Server as well as Spotlight on Windows. This tool is an agentless monitoring solution that's going to provide 24 by 7 by 365 monitoring of your SQL Server environment. So essentially what the product does is it implements a diagnostic server, which is essentially going to be a service that will run on a machine. The diagnostic server will be representative of the user that connects to SQL Server. So you'll set up that, that machine. It'll maintain the connectivity to SQL Server and to Windows and gather all of the performance data the operational data, the alarm information, and so on and so forth that's required for you to, to perform your role as a DBA. Any user that initiates a connection to Spotlight will essentially connect to the diagnostic server so you don't have to worry about users actually physically connecting to your SQL server because honestly, when you have a performance problem, as many hands as are available usually try to help to pitch in and solve whatever's occurring. So if you have a blocking lock issue, you'll have a number of different DBAs or other users in your environment trying to log on and determine what's happening. And in SQL Server, all of that contention can actually create a problem. You have the overhead of maintaining the connections to the database, people running SPWho and SPWho2, people launching profiler traces, running perfmon, and so on and so forth. Utilizing Spotlight, you have a single connection to your SQL Server. Essentially, the way it works is we're going to deploy a database to that instance of SQL Server. The purpose of the database is not to hold any data. We don't actually define any tables. There's no indexes there on anything. The database simply serves as a place for us to define stored procedures. All of our collection of SQL Server data is actually performed by running these stored procedures against that SQL Server and then gathering the data back to the diagnostic server for analysis and storage. Now, the overhead of monitoring your SQL Server is going to be about 1% of the monitored host CPU. That's going to be an unattended mode when nobody's actually connected utilizing their GUI. So basically, Spotlight's just performing its normal collection tasks. Once every 60 seconds, it's going to log into the SQL Server and the Windows environment, run the stored procedures and the WMI calls that are required to gather data, and then it's going to bring that data back and store it for you. 
When the first user logs into Spotlight, then the collection is going to be stepped up from once every 60 seconds to once every 15. And that's going to be so you have the best possible performance out of the GUI, so you're not sitting there, you know, with bated breath waiting for that 59th second to pass so you can get an update of the data on your screen. You're going to get a very responsive GUI that will show you exactly what's occurring in your environment without polling so frequently as to create a performance problem in and of itself. The attended mode is going to be 3% of the monitored host CPU, and that's going to be irrespective of how many users actually log in to the diagnostic server to review the data. So you can have one DBA looking at things, you can have 50 DBAs looking at them. It's not actually going to do anything different on the SQL Server host that you're monitoring. Now if we look a little bit closer at what the architecture, uh, how it's implemented, essentially what Spotlight does is it implements that diagnostic server which I've been discussing and that's marked as A on this slide. B is actually going to be a playback database. It's a SQL Server relational database that implements a star schema just like any other OLAP or CUBE style uh, drill down will, and it's going to store information to it for populating the GUI in a historical context. Because obviously not every DBA is going to be able to sit there and know when a performance problem is going to arise. You're not going to have people that are paid just to sit there and watch a monitor, you know, for one particular instance of SQL Server during their entire eight hour shift, and whenever anything goes awry, they'll already be watching it to know that it occurs. The diagnostic server is going to be collecting that data 24 by 7, so you need a way to leverage all of that information. And by utilizing the playback database, for up to a week in the past, you can go into Spotlight and actually review what occurred in your environment, even though you weren't actually there to see it yourself. So one of the classic use cases for that would be a blocking lock, for example. It's a problem that will be apparent whenever it's occurring. Users will experience timeouts, maybe an application will throw some errors. Uh, the amount of memory that SQL Server uses will increase, and that might lead to some internal or external memory pressure in some cases. There's a lot that can go wrong with the blocking lock, but it also is something that is eventually going to resolve itself. Lock timeouts will be in place, or maybe deadlocking will occur, and eventually the blocking lock will not be there any longer. So although the DBA may be aware that that's what happened, or maybe they'll guess that that's what's been occurring in an environment based on the feedback that he's been getting, you don't actually know unless you see it. So you're actually able to go into the Spotlight console and review the blocking lock information for up to seven days. So if you were away on the weekend, maybe you were actually out doing things other than work for the weekend, then you can always come back on Monday or Tuesday and review that information to understand what occurred. Or if you're, you're trying to firefight something that's occurring right now in an environment, and you just need to do whatever you can do to alleviate the problem, Spotlight gives you the ability to go back around afterwards and determine what led up to that problem in the first place so you can understand how you can put some safeguards in place so that it doesn't occur in the future. Now C is maybe one of those things that you can utilize very effectively to understand what's been occurring in your environment. The Spotlight Statistics Repository is another relational database. It also implements a star schema. Its purpose is not to feed the GUI, but to provide reporting so you can have trending information about your environment. How have your database log files been growing? How have your database data files been growing? How many users are logged into your database at any given point in time? What kind of throughput do you have to expect in your database environment? Those are all the kinds of questions that you can answer utilizing the statistics repository. You can also generate reports that managers might want. So you can get a SQL Server health check report, or you can get a Windows configuration report. You can get reports of you know, how many users are using your system at any given point in time, and then show how the CPU memory and disk are responding to all of that traffic. So there's a lot of information that's available in the repository that you can leverage either in your day-to-day -day operations to give yourself your own reports or to feed information to other members of your team. So I'm actually going to share out my desktop so we can look at the product itself. This is Spotlight on SQL Server Enterprise. So when you open up the tool, the first thing that you actually see is going to be the welcome screen, and the welcome screen is going to remind you of the architecture of the product. It's going to show you that we implement a diagnostic server, that the client machines connect to it, and that the diagnostic server is responsible for getting all of the data from SQL Server and from Windows. And it's going to prompt you to do anything that you may need to do to set the product up for your initial use of it. Um, when you actually go into an enterprise view, we've implemented enterprise views to allow you to categorize the servers in your environment logically instead of physically. So if you have a number of different groups in your environment, production, staging, development, active directory, and exchange, those are the five groups that we utilize in my office, so that's the grouping that I need to see here. 
In your environment, that may differ. You may set up any number of different arrangements for this data. The point is, is when you have a sprawling enterprise, it can be difficult to determine what sorts of information you need or what servers you need to be paying attention to and when. By utilizing this logical grouping, you can put servers in uh, groups in order of their criticality. And if you happen to have servers that are multitask, maybe you have a production server that is also running SQL Server in addition to, to being used as your Active Directory server or something you know, equally crazy and scary like that. So you can arrange your servers however you need to so that whoever needs to look at these different groups can be notified immediately as soon as there's a severe problem with one of those groups. And then by zooming in and looking at the individual servers, they can determine if there's any issues that they want to address. Now, if we go into a live connection, which is just a connection into one of the instances or Windows machines that you want to monitor, you're going to see a lot of information. One of the misconceptions of Spotlight is that anything that's this colorful that flashes at you and things like that can't possibly add any real value. It must be a tool for level 100 DBAs. When you look at this screen, it's actually amazing when you take into account how much information is actually being displayed about your SQL Server. So you have the instance of SQL Server. Now it's flashing red at me because I have a severe problem. Some people hate flashing. I don't necessarily blame them. So if we go into the options, we can actually turn that off. So if you don't want it to flash at you, then we can go into our severities and say that when something is critical, just show me that it's red, that's enough. It doesn't have to flash, I'll understand. So this is the instance of SQL Server that I'm dealing with. It, this, it's running this version of SQL Server, so I know I'm running SQL Server 2005, and I know that I'm higher than Service Pack 2. So that already tells me something as a DBA as far as some of the issues that I might want to be troubleshooting. I then have information basically from the end user level all the way down to the disk storage subsystem. So I've got information on the number of sessions that are connected to my SQL Server and the number of unique machines as well, which can be very significant in some environments. I can always see the number of active users. In this case, 5% of the users that are logged in are actually active. And then I have a roll-up of all of the more severe alarms that have occurred during this time frame. So this is going to show me up to the five most severe alarms that have occurred. It's going to give me an idea of where I may want to start. I then get information from my sessions going into SQL Server processes, which are going to be our network traffic of packets in and packets out, and our batch requests per second. I'll then have my SQL Server processes split up by system and user processes. I'll also have my lock requests per second, anything that may be interesting in my SQL Server error log, and an indication of how the underlying OS is utilizing CPU. I then have my compiles per second and logical reads into SQL Server memory. I'll see the overall memory that's available on the system and how much of it SQL Server is actually utilizing. I'll see the size of my buffer cache, its hit rate, and the page life expectancy metric. And I'll also see my procedure cache size and its hit rate. I'll then see indicators for whether or not I'm running replication and any SQL Server services issues that I may be having, SQL agent, which can you know, encapsulate uh, maintenance plans, it can be log shipping, it can be anything that you might run with SQL agent, it can be things with OLAP, so SSAS, SQL Server reporting services issues, DTC, full text search, all of that is going to be covered by the services. And then we can also here look at all of the physical disk access is going into my disk storage subsystem. I've got information on my data and my log files. Information on my databases and any that haven't been backed up will trigger this alarm here. And then I've also got my disk queue length metric down in the bottom right hand side of the screen. So there's an awful lot of information that's being related in a pretty simple format on this screen to provide you with as much as you can possibly give you on a dashboard view. Now once you see something that's not green, you can click on it and get information about the alarm that's being raised. So in this case, I'm going to see a log shipping alarm under my services. It's going to give me some information about what the alarm is, some steps that I can take when I see this alarm, and then it's always going to give me a related drill down to help me get to the root cause of the problem that I'm experiencing. So in this case, my log shipping has completely failed. I can see here from the publisher down to the subscribers, nothing's running in my environment. If I want to get more information, I can go into my SQL agent alerts and actually see how often I've been alerted about, in this case, log shipping from SQL, my SQL agent. I can also go into my SQL agent jobs and determine what's occurring with any of those jobs that are defined for SQL agent. Anything that succeeded or failed, and if it's failed, I'm going to get all of the job messages that are relevant for the failures of that job. Now, without using a root cause drill down, one of the things I want to mention is that when you implement Spotlight in your environment, you're going to set up the diagnostic server, and the diagnostic server is going to set up two groups of users for you to administer. So you're going to have the ability to specify certain DBAs 
as administrators and certain DBAs or other people in your environment as just regular users of the product. What that basically is going to allow you to do, so if we look at logical users or local users and groups, we'll see our diagnostic server administrators and our diagnostic users. The administrators are going to be able to perform administrative functions using this tool. So if I go into, for example, my memory drill down, I'm going to get information about the memory areas in SQL Server, the hit rates, and the sizes of my caches. If I go into the buffer cache drill down, I'll actually see the contents of my buffer cache, page allocations, and hit rates. And if I'm an administrator, I can actually clear the buffer cache. So while I'm in here trying to determine what percentage of various objects are being loaded up into the buffer cache, what percentage of the cache they comprise, and things along those lines, if I see a problem with this and the environment is one where I can actually clear the cache, then I can do that while I'm inside of Spotlight. I can do the same thing with the procedure cache. I can see the contents of the procedure cache. I can try to get a handle on whether or not my query plans are being reused. And if they are not, I can actually try to drill down into those individual procedures and try to determine why they're not being reused. If I want to, I can clear the procedure cache as an administrator. When I go into my session views, I'm going to see information about a summary of my SQL data, response time, the number of times users are logging in, call rates, cache rate ratios, and so on and so forth. I'll see SQL I.O. activity, so I can actually see my physical and logical I.O. I can see page splits, disk queue length. There's a lot of metrics available on that screen. I can go in and look at my sessions, and if I see a session that's utilizing too much CPU for my environment, as an administrator, I could kill the session if I wanted to. Now, if I don't want to kill the session, I just want to see maybe what it's doing, then I can actually click on one of these sessions and see the detail of it. So I'll get an FN get SQL, which will give me my most recent SQL that's been run. I'm going to get more information from an SP who to perspective as far as the SPID, the user that's logged in, the database that's being referenced, the program that's actually calling SQL Server. If I want to, and if I have Spotlight on SQL Server um, Enterprise Expert Edition, then I can actually take a SQL statement that I've captured here and send it to a tuning utility and actually tune that SQL statement to see, can I use alternate join syntaxes? Can I use query hints? Maybe I should define additional indexes in my environment. And all of that put together is going to lead me to a SQL statement that's going to be more efficient or more effective in my environment. Now, moving on in this view, there are some other things that we're going to be able to determine and some other actions we can take. If we look at the weight statistics, we can actually get a roll-up of all of the weight statistics that are occurring for our instance. And this will tell you where SQL Server is spending the majority of its time. If I have a blocking lock situation, then I can actually see the locks in my environment, the granted versus the waiting locks. I can also see in a blocking lock situation the blocking lock chain if there's a blocking lock condition right now. If there is, then I'm going to see all the usual information that I would in an SP lock. So I'm going to get information on the amount of time somebody's been waiting on a lock, the lock type that's waiting, the resource that's being waited on. These question marks will allow me to resolve the objects if I can what the commands are doing, the SQL user, the program, the Windows user, and so on and so forth, all the way down to the SQL statement that's involved in waiting on a blocking lock. And again, if I'm an administrator, I can go in here and kill one of the sessions that's creating the blocking lock in the first place. I can see information on IO by file, so I can determine if I'm having hotspots in my environment. Maybe one of my data files is a candidate for a partitioning function. Maybe I want to split off certain databases onto a separate spindle, because there's too much contention for reading or writing on that disk that's causing a slowdown in my environment. Spotlight also allows me to define SQL analysis, which is essentially going to be the equivalent of running a profiler trace. This is going to allow me to capture information on stored procedures, SQL, batch, and remote procedure call completed events. I can filter it just like I would in profiler with a certain application name or a host name or a login name or a database name all the way down to the performance of my SQL statement. And when I enable this, then essentially what I'm going to be telling Spotlight is I want you to capture all of the events that meet this criteria and save them in Spotlight so that when I come back for a historical resolution, I can actually see the SQL that was being run. If I'm, reading, if I'm looking at this in real time, then any time a statement completes, I actually want Spotlight to capture it and store it for me so that I can come back and review the SQL that's been running in my environment. So this is going to capture any of those different types of calls that complete and save them for me for my review in Spotlight. And again, if I have the expert version of the product, then I will be able to tune those statements using our SQL Optimizer product. Now getting back to what Spotlight shows you, if I go into the databases view, I can actually get a view of all of my databases, 
at a report level, first of all. So the overview is going to show me whether or not the databases are online, the size of the data, and whether I have any free space. Same thing for the log information. I get a report on the number of tables and indexes that are defined, as well as how many file groups are defined for that database, where they are as far as which disks they reside on, when the database was last backed up, and its recovery mode. Down below, when I click on an individual database, it's a bit easier to see down here, I'm going to be able to see information on the database space that's being utilized versus free, and I have a number of different metrics that I can graph out here on the bottom right-hand side. If I want to see active transactions, I can see that. So that color is probably not going to show up all that well in a WebEx. Um, backup throughput rate, log flushes rate, I can see log gross, log shrinks, log truncates. All that information is going to be available to me in this bottom graph. I can also see information about the file groups for that database, so I'll be able to get that information. Data files, transaction logs, log files, I can even see the tables that are defined inside of this database. So if I look, I can see the largest table in my database on down. It'll show me for that table, again, the used versus the reserve space for this table, the table growth either in megabytes or in rows. I can see both of those sorts of metrics down here. I can see where the table is defined, who owns it, how many rows there are, how, how large it is, how much free space there is, the percentage of the DB that it comprises, the size of the table itself, and the use space for it. So there's a lot of information on all the tables in my environment right here in Spotlight. I can also look at the indexes that are defined, and if I select an index on 2005 or 2008, I can actually get the index distribution statistics for it, as well as the density for the index, and a fragmentation uh, report for that individual index to let me know if I need to add this to my index maintenance jobs. If I want to, I can also right click on this index and update the statistics for the index directly from Spotlight. Now a lot of what I'm showing you is not necessarily going to be a reinvention of the wheel. Spotlight isn't going to do a lot of things that uh, you can't already, already do from SQL Server Management Studio or from Query Analyzer or maybe from SQL Command or if you guys use PowerShell. Depending on how you, uh, how you administer your environment, you may already have a number of different ways that you achieve many of the, uh, many of the items that I've, I've addressed so far. Now, that's all well and fine, but a lot of times when you're already inside of something, like I'm inside of Spotlight, I'm trying to diagnose a problem, I'm trying to get to the root cause, and while you're doing that, you happen upon maybe a configuration in SQL Server that's not correct. You could make a note for yourself and go back and take care of it at a later date. Maybe you notice that max server memory isn't set in your environment. It's a new server. Uh, you didn't realize that it wasn't set and it's set to the default. You can, as an administrator through Spotlight, adjust that on the fly as soon as you notice the problem, and then you can alleviate one more task without having to either switch out to SQL Server Management Studio or open up a command line window or write yourself a note and hope to get back to it, or email another junior DBA for them to take care of this issue. You can take care of it from one place, and it's going to be the same sort of a situation for support services. Maybe I go in here and I see that OLAP isn't running. For me in my environment, that's a problem. You could just right-click and start the service, or I could start, you know, start and then run and then go to services if I have it in a shortcut, or I can type out services and try to go there and take care of it at that point. And that's not necessarily an arduous or a tedious process, but it is going to be wasting time when you could just right-click on something that you see in front of you and take care of it right away. Another thing we can do here is look inside of the error log. You can look inside of the SQL Server, the SQL Agent error log. Again, not anything that you couldn't do in another form or fashion, but while you're already here, it'll save you time if one GUI is going to meet all of these needs in the same place. Now, Whenever I do see something of concern, when I look at this home page, anything here that's going to be read, like for example, I have the four processes that are waiting on my blocking locks, and I can go to my blocking drill down and see that it's a problem. If I don't want to wait until I receive a notification from mom or system center or patrol or open view or a ticketing system that you guys have implemented somehow, maybe you guys have very proactive customers that as soon as they see a problem, they're going to call you up. Maybe you have an OLTP system that's supporting a sales force. Maybe you have an order entry application that has a database backend that you need to support. There's all sorts of things that you may need to take care of in your environment where there's going to be a lot of eyes on the project that you're working on. If you can be proactive about taking care of any performance anomalies that may arise, that's obviously going to be a benefit. So utilizing Spotlight, you can go into the alarms configuration and set up a number of different rules for the alarms that are already being triggered through this product. Like, for example, if I have a SQL agent job that fails, then Spotlight can notify me when I have a failure. There are a number of different severities I can set. 
So I can have low, medium, and high, for example, and have thresholds for, in this database environment, uh, low is going to be one job, medium is going to be three jobs, high is going to be five jobs. Maybe in a production environment, then high is going to be the second one SQL agent job fails at the high severity alarm, you need to be notified. You can specify the description of the alarm that's going to be raised. You can actually send an email directly from the diagnostic server so that when that condition is met, it's going to send out an email to whoever the recipients are that you specify. With this subject and this message, you just basically set up your email by putting in your SMTP options here. So once you set up your distribution list, those individuals will be notified whenever this condition is met. Now you can also run a program. Running a program allows us to interface with tools like Patrol and OpenView and System Center and, and MOM. Because using the program, uh, the command line interface, for example, you could do a raise event in Windows. Using a raise event, you're going to write to the application log. A lot of those other third-party tools are going to be, or the end-to-end -end monitoring tools, I should say, are going to be reading the application log or looking in the application log for a pattern. If you write to it with the pattern that they're expecting, then Spotlight can let you integrate with those products so that you're seamlessly going to have email distributions from that source that you've already got configured. You can also run a batch process that'll do a raise error in SQL Server. And as long as you do a raise error with log for a severity of 18 or higher, then you can write to the application log in Windows and the SQL Server error log, both. So again, anything that might be looking at either of those two logs can notify you. You can, once a SQL agent job failed, have a batch file defined and have that run from the command line as soon as the failure occurs. And in some environments where it's appropriate, you could automatically relaunch that job or rerun the job and hope for success the second time around. So there are a number of steps that you can take here automatically, as well as setting up your automatic notifications whenever these issues may arise in your environment. Now, you can set this up for the diagnostic server, and the diagnostic server is going to, be handle, is going to handle up to 50 instances of SQL Server at a time. If you want to specify something unique for one or you know, a few of the instances that you're monitoring, then you can update the alarms just for one instance. And in this case, this view is going to tell me that I'm updating my statistics for just this instance, and it's going to tell me again in this yellow line just to make sure that you see that you're only going to be updating this information for one instance, because maybe this instance has a specific database that you, know, you don't necessarily need to back up. So you don't want this database to start alerting you based on the alarming mechanism that you've already set up. So you can go into this exclusion view and set up another one of those third-party application vendor uh, databases that you don't want Spotlight to send you an email about when you haven't backed it up. So there's all sorts of use cases for having to set this configuration for an individual instance versus for the entire diagnostic server. And the same is going to be true for how frequently we store data. You may or may not want to be storing trending statistics for all of the instances that you're monitoring. If you do, great. You can go into the diagnostic server and you can just make sure that you're storing data as frequently as you need to for all of the instances that you're monitoring. If there are certain instances that you don't want to monitor, then you can go to the scheduling and set it up so that you're not storing statistics for the instance that you're currently sitting on. Now, when you set it at the diagnostic server level, basically just like the alarms, you're going to be configuring how often Spotlight is going to collect data, store it, and then how long it's going to keep that information. So by default, certain data is going to be kept for three days, some for a week, some for two weeks, some for 90 days, some for a year. It's going to be up to you to go through this list and determine if that's appropriate for your environment. But generally speaking, the defaults are going to be sufficient, and those defaults are going to feed reports like, for example, my SQL Server uh, configuration report. So I can look at my hardware configuration, I can go to the instance uh, that I'm worried about, and then I can see the information for the hardware configuration on that server. When I use a larger resolution, by the way, you can see all of this without the scrolling. Um, I'm just trying to accommodate as many database or as many desktops as possible. Same thing for my operating system information, same thing for my SQL Server configuration. All of my SP configure information is here. I can see my database files. I can see my database file growth, I can see my log file growth, I can see database settings. So any of that information that you might want to see is going to be available here. SQL Server general statistics, uh, Windows general statistics, all of that can be graphed out. And then in this graph, you can actually take this information and export it. And if you export it, you're going to be sending the metric data out to CSVs and all of these graphs are going to be generated as JPEG images. So if you want to write any of your own reporting, 
then you can have the pictures already set up for you and the data is already there separated out into a CSV. So for manipulations purposes or if you're going to load it up into a database, it's simpler to do it without any formatting that would be incurred with the actual um, pictures themselves. Now there's also some client-side rendered reports. Just like in SQL Server 2008 where they introduced reporting services reports that you can render on the client, these are basically going to look a lot like reporting services, but they're basically going to render on the client. So you don't have to deploy these reports to a reporting services server. You can just generate them wherever a Spotlight console is installed. And just by clicking on the diagnostic server and the connection that you want to report on, as well as specifying the time range, then you're going to have a report, in this case a SQL Server health report, that will be generated to show you the number of logged in users, the batches, recompiles and compiles, the buffer and procedure cache information, as well as page life expectancy, and SQL Server total and target memory, so you can see if you've been under memory pressure for that instance of SQL Server. So all of that's going to be available. You're also going to be able to connect to a reporting services server if you'd like, and Spotlight has 22 reports that are available from our website for download that can do everything from showing you database growth to enterprise health to SQL Server health. Um, so a lot of these various reports are going to be useful in your environment. You don't have to utilize reporting services in order to take advantage of these because basically all they are are RDL templates that leverage the Spotlight Statistics repository and provide you with pre-formatted select statements to get the trending information out. So if you want to leverage this without reporting services, if you have SQL Server installed, then you can go to SQL Server and you can go to SQL Server Business Intelligence Development Studio open up that RDL file, and then you've got the select statements already there for you. So you have some choices. You can either run these reports on an ad hoc basis. You can modify them just by changing the select statement. Maybe something's currently set up to be a single instance report. You can actually set it up to be an enterprise level report by adding one field to the select statement and a group by statement in the where clause, and then you're going to have an enterprise level report as opposed to a report just on one instance at a time. So there's a lot of flexibility here as well. And then the last thing that I wanted to show you was going to be the history browser. So when you're trying to troubleshoot something that had occurred in the past, then you're going to basically be working, generally speaking, you're going to be working off of a ticket, or maybe you're going to be working from a call that you got or some other notification that's going to tell you that you had a problem and there's something that you need to address in your SQL Server environment. So if I pick a particular connection that I want to see information for, let me pick my 2005 instance here. I want to see a block processes alarm, but I don't necessarily want to see it right now. I want to see when I had it in the past. So if I scroll back in my history browser, I'm going to be able to determine if I had a block processes alarm farther back in history. I don't. So let me go to when I actually did have one. So here's a block processes alarm that I had. I'll right click, I'll show the selected entry in my history browser, and then I'm going to have my spotlight views just as I would in a real-time capacity, but in this case it's telling me that it's showing me this morning at, uh, in this case, 10.30 a.m. So this is the state of my SQL Server at that point in time. This is going to be my blocking alarm that was raised at that point in time. I can actually go to the blocking drill down. So here's the blocking lock chain that occurred at that point in time. I can look at the sessions that were logged into my SQL Server at that point in time. Maybe I want to go in and look at the contents of my buffer cache at that point in time to understand what was actually being run. I can see that information. I can go in and look at my databases from that point in time and understand what was occurring in some of my individual SQL Server databases during that time frame. Um, there's a lot of information that I can determine, whether or not any of my services were running or I had SQL agent jobs that were throwing errors at that time. If I had SQL analysis enabled, I'm actually going to be able to get SQL data from that point in time. If I want to see what led up to that problem in the first place, then I can go back to a point in time before then and click play, and then this GUI is actually going to take me snapshot by snapshot through a progression in my environment so I can see things as they were going wrong. So here all of a sudden I have a page life expectancy alarm that's being thrown. Then I have a disk queue length alarm that was being thrown. Those two problems are going to continue. I have another couple of thresholds here that I have to meet. And then I'm going to get down to my block processes alarm, at which point, at any point in time, when I see something of interest, then I can pause this so it stops advancing me through the screens, and then I can go through and investigate the problem in the tool. 
So essentially, that's what you're going to see in Spotlight on SQL Server. Now, I did mention in the beginning of my presentation that this is a meld of a SQL Server monitoring solution and a Windows monitoring solution. One of the nice things about Spotlight on SQL Server Enterprise is that the licensing works in such a way that you only license the SQL servers that you want to monitor. Monitoring Windows machines actually is not something that you have to pay for using this tool. So you can monitor, let's say, 10 instances of SQL Server. Actually, it's going to be 10 servers because this is going to be licensed by server. So you can monitor as many instances or, or many servers of SQL Server as you want, and then you can put Spotlight on the rest of the Windows machines in your environment. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, if you've ever looked at Task Manager and tried to figure out what was going on with a process, you very quickly noticed that if you hadn't been looking all along, you're not going to be able to get historical information. Maybe you don't have a high enough level of logging set up to write to the Windows event log, so you're really going to be in the dark as far as what's been occurring with your Windows processes. Going into the process view here will let me see something like, for example, the age-old debate between DBAs and system administrators. How do I know if external memory pressure has affected my SQL Server? Well, clicking on the SQL Server service, first of all, will show me all of the relevant information for that process. So I can see things like, how big is the VAST for my SQL Server? Uh, how much of the process is it using? Um, you know, who's actually running that service? I can see a process history, which is something that isn't always available to people when they're looking at things in Windows. So here, if I look at memory usage for my SQL Server process, if at any point in time this dipped, then I know that Windows actually made SQL Server release memory, because otherwise SQL Server will not release its memory back to Windows. It's going to take as much as it needs, and then it's going to keep that memory until something tells it that it needs to release the memory back. So you can utilize a number of different things in this view. You can look at more detailed information about the memory um, that's in your system. You can see where your page files are defined. You can see things about the Windows cache. You can go in and look at networking information. You can look at more detailed information about the disks that are defined in your environment. Uh, the only things that are really going to trip up Spotlight are going to be the things that will trip up Windows, which are going to be things like RAID controllers and SAN storage, because those metrics are not accurately going to be reported for the disk counters on Windows anymore, at which point we're actually going to be releasing a version of Spotlight that will deal with that issue by TechEd of 2009, which is going to be May of 2009, and that will allow you to seamlessly integrate a number of different custom counters into the Spotlight views so that you'll be able to add those sorts of things if they're a reality in your environment. So at this point, I am going to open it up for questions. Thanks very much, Ari. Um, we already have some questions, but if you'd like to ask a question for Ari, please uh, send them in. You can either do that through the chat panel, or um, uh, you can raise your electronic hands and we will unmute your, your phone. Got a couple of questions already, uh, Ari. One from Bob Conway. I think he's referring to this slide you've got now. Are B and C Quest products or provided by Microsoft? And those are actually Quest products. The way that it works is when you install the Spotlight product, you're essentially going to install the GUI. And then at which point the GUI will open and it'll tell you that you don't have a diagnostic server. It'll prompt you to install that, which is A. And then as soon as that's installed, it'll prompt you to install B. It'll allow you to specify the server where you want to put that database and where you want to define the data in log files just like any other uh, SQL Server database. One thing of note is that that server will be configured in line with the model database on that instance. So if model is already set up to do full recovery, for example, then you might want to go into our Quest databases and set those back to simple recovery mode. Same thing is going to apply for C. C is not something that Quest will actually require you to install. You do not have to have a long-term performance repository. However, if you'd like one, then you will be able to, using the Spotlight GUI, deploy that repository, and as well as with the playback database, you'll be able to decide where you want the data and log files to reside. Great. We have a question from Simon Young. hope I pronounced that correctly, Simon. If you have SQL 2000 running, can the tool monitor it and produce the same level of monitoring information? Yes. Spotlight is actually going to work on SQL Server 2000 SP3 and higher. SQL Server 2005, and it's also working on SQL Server 2008. We can also monitor in clustered environments. If anybody was going to ask about that, 
Microsoft Veritas or PolySurf clusters, as long as you can connect to them as you would to a normal SQL Server instance, we can actually monitor those with Spotlight. Okay, great. Um, Niels Frank had a question. Niels, your phone is open, so you can ask the question. Niels? Oh, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, can you actually monitor outside of your network, uh, like, uh, SQL servers, like when you're hosting, like, SQL servers somewhere else? You can. Um, as long as you can provide credentials that will connect to those SQL servers, then that's not a problem. So sometimes, you know, people will set up trust between domains. Sometimes that's not a reality, so they'll have to rely on um, setting up a user that's somehow defined in the environment that they want to monitor or only get SQL Server monitoring data by using a SQL Server user versus a Windows user. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, a follow-up question from Simon. What's the performance impact on the server being monitored? Okay, so the performance impact of monitoring a server is going to be 1% of the monitored host CPU when you're not currently logged in to look at things in the console. So the polling is going to occur once every 60 seconds, and that's going to take up to about 1% of the monitored host CPU. When the first user logs into the console, then the monitoring is going to be increased in frequency from once every 60 seconds to once every 15, at which point that's estimated to take 3% of the monitored host CPU. As far as the, if you're, if you're wondering more about a memory, uh, things from a memory standpoint, then it's going to be somewhat dependent on the minimum query memory that you assign in SQL Server. Um, but on the, for the most part, the impact is negligible since we are just using stored procedures and we're not actually calculating anything on the SQL Server host. Um, Ari, you, you might have just answered Karen Greenwood's question, which was how much space does Spotlight generally use? Okay, that's going to be somewhat dependent on the way that you set it up. But by default, the playback database, which on that this slide is going to be B, the playback database is estimated to be 2.5 gig per server. It is capped at a weekly cycle, so every seven days we're going to be um, basically refreshing the data. Every hour we're going to be purging out data that's older than that seven-day threshold. The Spotlight Statistics Repository is estimated to grow to 3.5 gig per instance per year. Now, you can affect those storage profiles by deciding uh, which metrics you want to collect, how often, and how long to retain them, and all of that can be achieved through the GUI. But by default, that's going to be 3.5 gig per server per year. Great. We have a question now from uh, Rainbow Chen. Uh, Rainbow, I just unmuted your phone so you can ask the question. Okay, Rainbow, we can't hear you, but you did send it into the Q&A panel, so I'm going to ask that question for you. Okay. Does this tool have the ability to trace a table's changes, insert, update, and delete? Um, well, if we're talking about changes to a table, usually I would think about DDL and not DML. But if we're talking about insert, update, and delete statements, then as long as you turn on SQL analysis, we will capture any statement that's completed that meets the criteria that you specify. Um, so that trace is going to be as granular or as exact as you know, the thresholds allow it to be. By default, it's going to look for any statement that runs for one second or longer uh, when it's completed. You can change those thresholds to as low as one millisecond as far as how long it ran. The only query or the only problem that I would see with that is, you know, the usual constraints that would be put in place whenever you utilize a trace, which is going to be the impact on the SQL Server host because of that trace feature. So, yes, we can do it. Uh, you should definitely exercise caution, however, when utilizing that feature. Okay. Uh, Follow-up question from Karen Greenwood. Will I need one license to monitor a cluster environment or two? That's the, the question that gets me in trouble with salespeople all the time. Um, you do need two licenses. However, how much the passive node license costs, if it costs at all, is going to be up to the agreement that you reach with your sales representative. Okay. A follow-up question from Simon. 
Um, uh, all SP stats like exec time blocks, etc., for running SP tracked in SQL activity. If so, does it require SQL analysis? Does it need an extra license? It does not require an extra license. Um, SQL analysis is going to capture individual statement data as opposed to database or instance level data. So we will capture a, a very large sample of the metrics that are going to be relevant for SQL Server. There is actually a list that's available in the online help for the product if you really want to go uh, very deep into looking at which metrics are available. Um, you don't have to buy additional licenses to utilize that functionality. When you install the diagnostic server component, then that machine, and this is something that's covered in the release notes and the deployment guide for Spotlight, which you can download from either the Quest website or I would imagine from the Programmer's Paradise sources as well, um, the diagnostic server will require client tools to be installed on it uh, for SQL Server 2005 in order to use SQL analysis. Okay, great. Um, for, for anyone who's interested in, in uh, pricing or configuration information, um, we'll give you some, some uh, contact information later on so that uh, a, a programmer's paradise sales rep will be able to answer any questions that you have. Um, any other questions for, um, for, for Ari? Uh, if so, please raise your electronic hand or send it in through the, uh, the chat panel or the Q&A panel. Okay, looks as if you've answered every question that they have, uh, Ari. Great, great job. Okay, so um, thank you for attending uh, this session today. This was the third session actually on the Spotlight on Performance Suite. Um, we already have two additional, two uh, webinars that were completed. Those are available uh, for on-demand recording uh, via programmers.com slash quest. If you go to that URL, you'll see a big banner at the top of the, the page. And you can uh, listen to the Oracle SQL webinar as well as the Spotlight on Messaging Performance uh, uh, webinar. So if you're interested in how Spotlight can help with Microsoft Exchange or BlackBerry or Office Communication Server, that's, that's the session you should, uh, you should follow up. Today's presentation will also be available. Um, you can check on the same URL tomorrow, and uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, revisit uh, Ari's presentation uh, on, online. So thank you for attending. If you'd like some more information on Quest software solutions for uh, application management or database management, virtualization or Windows management, Please contact us. Uh, our sales reps are, uh, are more than happy to help you uh, with any questions that you'll have. Uh, I would recommend that if you're interested in any of the Spotlight products, that you, um, you, you contact us. There's a great uh, evaluation special available where, where we can um, uh, get you an evaluation product, evaluation download of the product. And we'll also uh, set up a special one-on-one -on -one web conference to talk you through uh, that evaluation and, and how you should go about it. So you can register for the evaluation special by phone or by email. Just contact us at the phone numbers uh, on the screen, or just send an email to info at programmers.com. So thank you again for attending today, and thank you, Ari, for a great presentation. I uh, hope you all have a great day, and we look forward to seeing you on our webinar series in the future. Thank you.